And, and if, if this is something that is, has been on your mind, let me know because it'll be the most random thing. Okay, you so get the I random heard. award. So what did you kids ask? <laughs> yeah, yeah this, I promise you they didn't ask this question, so it'll be, it'll be interesting anyway. So uh, let's start with a word of prayer and then jump on into it. Lord, we love you. Grateful to study your word today. Lord, we're grateful for um, the information we get to sink our teeth into and uh, really enjoy the savory flavors of truth. Uh, Father, I am grateful as always uh, for the death, burial, and resurrection of you, Jesus, and um, the fact that it has afforded us salvation. We're grateful for it. We trust you, Lord. Holy Spirit, now as we dig in, I pray that you help us to understand and grasp this and then uh, do our best to present it to others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all turn to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. While y'all are doing that, I'm going to draw a line. <laughs> Crowder, we missed you, man. Glad to have you back. I've been with you on YouTube. <laughs> That's right, in spirit. And in fact, it does show up, I think, on the, uh, the what do you call it, the analytics and stuff. You know, we always have a viewer from Spain. I'll go, look, there's crowd. Thank you, Norm. <laughs> yeah, Norm, Norm has been golden, freeing me up from all that. So, all right, Daniel chapter 9. Uh, let's read verse 27. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant, the he being the Antichrist, as it turns out, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. You know, if you're just a casual reader of the Bible, that verse makes zero sense. It's like, what in the world is it talking about? Now, without getting too deep in the weeds, because we have covered this verse before, Daniel chapter 9 is a prophecy concerning end time sort of stuff. At the time Daniel received this prophecy, this vision and everything, he himself was kind of clueless about it. And in fact, Peter even talks about that when you get over into Peter you know, he said the prophets looked into this and they didn't really know what they were hearing and it wasn't for them, it was for a future generation. Um, but we know from previous study that Daniel's prophecy here concerns a 70-week period of time. Okay? 70 weeks. Now, here's the thing, and, and again, we've covered this before, but just in brief... You've got to understand the Hebrew concept of a week. When you see that word week in the Old Testament, it doesn't necessarily mean a period of seven days. It means simply just a period of seven anythings. It could be uh, days, weeks, years, months, whatever. And so you have to kind of study the context and look at the context to determine which period of seven we're talking about. Now, just to kind of cut to the chase here, in context, Daniel is talking and thinking in terms of years. So when he says 70 weeks, that is 70 periods of seven years. All right, mathematicians. Caleb? 70 times 7 is? 490. 490. So 490 year period of time um, is what this prophecy is about. Now, the last week of this 490-year period of time, the last period of seven years, is what we call the tribulation. Um, okay? Tribulation. I'm going to just do this. Okay, I'm kind of zooming in on the timeline. Over here, uh, as he said right there in verse 27, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Okay? So what is going to initiate the tribulation period on the earth 
is that the Antichrist is going to sign a covenant promising peace and safety. My guess is, especially the way the world political situation is right now, the world economic system is, Israel is going to be really hungry for somebody really to provide them some security. Okay? Um, and so they'll be very anxious, or I should say um, excited to sign this thing. I think they'll be willing to do that. But that will initiate the last period of seven years of Daniel's prophecy, known as the 70th week. That's why you'll hear sometimes if you're reading Bible commentaries, they'll talk about Daniel's 70th week. They're talking about the tribulation. You'll read other commentaries that call it the tribulation. Then you'll read some commentaries that call it the great tribulation. However, you've got to be careful there. When we talk about great tribulation, technically speaking, that is only the last half of the tribulation period. Okay, Caleb, what is half of seven? Three and a half. Three and a half, okay. <laughs> you got really nervous on that. Like, man, I didn't know I was coming for a math quiz today. I'm going right down the line here. He's a math minor. <laughs> math minor? You better know what half of seven is then, okay? No way in the <laughs> <laughs> um, So, halfway point, you got three and a half years, okay? And three and a half years. This is not to scale. Oh, I did inches. This is not to scale, by the way. But anyway, it's three and a half years and three and a half years. All right. Y'all with me so far? Yep. Rita? I'm here. Okay. Making sure. So the last week or the last period of seven years is known as the tribulation. Okay? And we typically think of it in halves like this. Now, if you do the math and you compare with Scripture your math, okay, really if you derive your math from the Scripture... A year in biblical terms is typically 360 days. Okay, quiz. Rita? I don't know math. Now I'm not asking you math. Alright. In modern terms, today, how long, how many days is a year? 365. You sure? <laughs> I'm going to ask our resident well, scientist. You got leap year and you got not leap year. So okay, which means what? Every four years you add a day. So that means you have a quarter of a day every year technically. So 365 and a quarter. If you want to put it in decimal, 365.25. There you go. Is that close enough, Jonathan? That's is it? Good. Is it literally a quarter? I'm just kind of curious now. Or is it like 0. 0.25789235? Or probably. Or probably something like that. All right, so, but when you, when you think in biblical terms, and when you talk about a year, you're talking 360 days. Let me write that up here just to... And then you know what? 360. They use a 360-day year. Something to do with the moon, I guess. Previously, to, or prior to Noah's flood, the year was 360 days after the flood because of the explosions and things, the earth, uh, its axis changed, and it's... Uh, orbital thing change so it's 365 and 40. That's good. That's good. Uh, if you want to do a deep, and that's like, honestly, like if you want to do a deep dive and stuff, it actually gets pretty interesting, but it also gets really complicated, especially when you start talking about calendars and dating and stuff like you got Julian calendars, you got the solar calendar, you got the lunar calendar, you got other stuff. And it, to be honest with you, not my wheelhouse. If it's something that excites you, go for it. Okay? Go for it. Caleb is going to go for it. Go ahead. What's funny is, is a lot of the ancient civilizations and all, they all had their own separate story on where this weird five days came from. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, so everyone knew previously that it was supposed to be 360 days, but now something's different. Yeah. Like the Egyptians, I believe... One well, goddess want to see her son more often, so she bartered for five days of extra life from the moon god, hmm. and that's where that extra five days. What you're telling me is they had to invent some kind of story to make up for the gap there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, 360 days. Okay. I promise y'all, I didn't bring y'all here today to do a math lesson, but you got to hang with me. We're gonna do a little math. Rita, don't, don't check out on me. 
Okay. Karen, thank you for the donuts. Karen brought me donuts today. She wants. She no. She likes me fat, and so I'm gonna eat some donuts a little bit. All right. Now, um, in prophecy, we see this seven-year period of tribulation on Earth broken in half generally. And it's going to talk about it in terms of months. It'll also talk about it in terms of days. I want you all to see this. Go with me to Revelation chapter 11. This is all the setup. You are thinking, what are you setting up for, Greg? Because right now, we have no idea where you're headed. Revelation chapter 11. Now, again, Crowder, did you see the, the series that we did on what, what to do with Hebrews through Revelation? Okay, that was... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's the most boring study we ever did, man, Sorry. so thank you. <laughs> you decided to do it that way. <laughs> yeah, it, it was the presenter, not the question, right? <laughs> it was a good question. And in fact, I thought, when I got into it, I thought, yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> and I guess, you know, I thought it was going to be just real, like, whoo, people are just going to just get, you know, chill bumps from it. And it didn't happen. But, you know, the only thing I got chill bumps from in here was the air conditioning because it's freezing to them. But, uh, all right, Revelation chapter 11. Again, Revelation, though, is a book in the prophetic division of Scripture, okay? So this is stuff that is also consistent with the, uh, the Old Testament. Revelation chapter 11, starting verse 1. And there was given me, John the Revelator says, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise. And measure the temple of God and the altar in them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Caleb, how many months is seven years? What is half of 84? Okay, so we're talking here about half of the tribulation there when he says 40 and 2 months, right? And he goes on, verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy what? A thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth. Now the score is 20, so 3 score is 60. So 1,260. So 3 and a half years, 42 months, okay, is also 1,260 days. Same over here. 42 months, 1,260 days. Now, in this particular uh, part of the prophetic scriptures here. He's only talking about the first half of uh, the tribulation period there. But notice 1,260 days. Go over with me to chapter 12 now. And look with me. Drop down to verse 3. And how do we know it's the first half? If you get back into chapter 10 in the lead up here, this section of Revelation is a parenthetical. Um, you get this heavenly vision stuff, and so it kind of backs out of the narrative. And so I'm just kind of skipping that right now. But also, in comparison with chapter 12, you'll see that is, in fact, the second half. Uh, it'll give you some clues. Uh, chapter, uh, verse 3, chapter 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon. We know who that is, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Okay. Just to kind of cut to the chase here. The child being born here, uh, you know, a Jewish man child is Jesus. Okay. At the time of Jesus' birth, what was Satan up to? He wanted to destroy him. Because he knew he was the Son of God. He knew he was the Messiah. See, Satan never doubted that. He just didn't want anybody else to believe it. Okay? All right, so now, keep reading. And she, that is Israel, brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. Notice there's a jump there. Okay? So you go from the birth of Jesus, which was back when he was here on earth, to all of a sudden to rule all nations. When will Jesus rule all nations? 
in the kingdom as king. So you see there's a jump there in time. You have to sometimes you have to be very disciplined when you read the scriptures and remember the time gaps here. He says, who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was called up unto God. Now he kind of goes back. When was Jesus called up to God? Right before, at the ascension, right before Pentecost, okay? And to his throne. Now verse 6. And the woman, this is Israel now, so after Jesus ascends, okay, what was supposed to happen prophetically? Daniel's 70th week. That would have been the next series of prophetic events. Okay? Now, what is peculiar about Daniel's 70th week of prophecy, which was to happen after Jesus' ascension, we know something was going to happen to Israel. In particular, from the midway point on, this remnant, okay, they are going to be on the run, literally running for their lives. Okay? And Jehovah God is going to be a protection to them. And that's what Revelation talks about here in verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there. Now how long is it going to last? A thousand, two hundred, and three score days. One thousand, two hundred and sixty days. Okay? So you put those together and you get seven years. Okay? Alright. This is just kind of all touching the surface here. Now, this is where it gets complicated. You got seven years... If we do the math, we got 2,520 days total. Alright? But this is where it gets fun and interesting, and this is really what we're going to talk about today. Y'all turn with me now back to Daniel, except go to Daniel chapter 12. <laughs> Daniel chapter 12. It has already been 30 minutes. Has it felt that way to y'all? I'm no. always curious. Like sometimes I know y'all like, yes, Greg, it has felt like an hour and 30 minutes. For me, it never feels that way, but I'm a motor mouth. All right, Daniel chapter 12. Uh, let's start reading in verse 8. Okay. Now again, we're still in the prophetic division of Scripture, so this is all going to be consistent. All right. Uh, Daniel chapter 12, starting in verse 8. Daniel says, And I heard, but I understood not this whole prophecy, this vision that he has received. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Pause! Where on this timeline is the abomination that causes desolation? Okay, at the midpoint. Here's how we know that. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. We'll probably look at that here in a minute. Remember Jesus, the Olivet Discourse. He's talking. He's, he's, you know, the disciples ask Him, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming? And all this stuff. And He says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation in the temple, then He says, flee. Get out of here. Get out of town. Don't go back get your clothes. Just go. Okay? Right here at the midpoint. So the abomination that caused desolation. So from this point forward, what does he say? So we're talking tribulation, and what does he say now? There shall be a thousand, it should say one thousand and two hundred and three score days. Is that what it says? What does it say, Cotton? Nine, nine days. Don't All right. I'm not a mathematician. Caleb is. Caleb, is 1,260 the same as 1,290? <laughs> See, I know you. Yeah. You will try to make it the same, right? But no, there's a 30-day difference, okay? So we've got an additional 30 days right there that we've got to account for. We're still not finished. 
There's a discrepancy in the prophecies right now. So far, a discrepancy of 30 days. So either the scriptures are wrong or something else is going on. Okay? Well, we're not finished yet. Um, and so anyway, verse 11 there, there shall be 1,290 days. Now come on to verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. Okay, 1,335. 1,335. 1,290. If I do the math, if I subtract that from that, that's an additional... 45 days now. Caleb, what's 30 plus 45? 75. 75 days. Okay. So in prophecy, there is a difference of 75 days. The 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel talks about a seven year period of time, a total of, you know, 2,520 days. And then all of a sudden when we get down to the end of Daniel, we've got an additional 75 days that we've got to account for. What's going on here? Okay? And that's what I want us to look at today. Again, if anybody here was thinking about this before you came today, I need to know right now. I didn't think so. I told you, this one's coming out of left field. Alright, so as it turns out, there are actually, within this 75-day seventy-five, period, 75 day period of time, it's right out here at the end, okay? Uh, as it turns out, there's, there's about eight different things going on within this period of time that we're going to look at today. Pretty interesting stuff, and some of it's pretty incredible, actually, um, that, that occur within that, that period of time. And so, and these, the things that happen within this 75 day period of time must occur before we get into ba -ba -da -da, the millennial kingdom. Alright? Y'all with me? Y'all excited? Everybody excited? Woo! Woo. <laughs> this is part of your this is part of your biblical education. Alright? So need to know this because there is a discrepancy. Now from from the information given in scripture we one of the things that we cannot do, the stuff that happens within that block of time out here at the end, okay? Let me do this to make things clear. Okay? The events that happen within that 75-day period of time, it's impossible for us from the Bible to put them in chronological order. You can try to rationalize it, but the reality is the Bible doesn't put it in chrono chronological order. You just know that there are things that are happening out here in that period of time. Um, and so, uh, we're going to look at these. Y'all go back with me to Daniel chapter... Well, you're probably already in Daniel chapter 12. Let's look at the first thing that happens. Daniel chapter 12, and read with me verse 11 again. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away... Okay, which is right out here at the midpoint. Okay. From the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So here's what this tells us. Within this 75-day period of time, for 30 days, for a month of that time, the desecration of the temple, which occurred back here at the midpoint, which what, what it was is the Antichrist set himself up as God in the temple. And he forced worship, okay? That desecration of the temple will be allowed to extend past the seven year mark. And it will be allowed to extend about 30 days before Jesus, who, is, who has returned to the earth, is going to clean house. Alright? So that is one of the things that is going to happen in that, in that intermediate period of time. Now, go with me to Revelation chapter 19. I'm going to hit on these first few briefly and then we'll take a break. Revelation chapter 19. I have no idea. You know, there's a question that's come up recently because we know when we get out of the kingdom there's still going to be sacrifices. And one of the explanations that I've heard about that is it, it will serve as a memorial much the same way that we, when we do the Lord's Supper. It's, it's not for the atoning of our sins or anything. And the same out here because Jesus has already done that. 
Um, so what's it for? And a lot of people believe it's for a memorial. And so um, I don't know, knowing that the Antichrist is trying to counterfeit Jesus, um, the sacrifices may be a, a form of worship to him. But I mean, they're doing sacrifices now in Israel, like in the temple. I don't know. Well, now there's no temple yet. There's because the dome of the rock is in its place, so it's a you know it's a real abomination to them right but now. Not doing any in synagogues or anything. I don't like think that. so. I don't know. I really don't. I, I don't know. Does anybody else know that? I haven't really looked into it. I do know. So, just in my studies of Ezekiel, you know, after after the Babylonian captivity, obviously they get scattered out, and the temple's going, and all the stuff. And so, what happens to the sacrifice sacrificial system at that point? That's another kind of unique thing that I haven't really got too deep into. But I know in Ezekiel, it, there's, there's a part in there, and I can't remember the exact chapter right offhand, but it, it lends itself to be interpreted as this thing where God makes a way for the synagogue system. You know? And so, um, but free of the sacrifices that were necessary under the law. Well, so. in that Daniel chapter, or that Daniel verse 11, it's saying, from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away. Yeah, so there's some kind of sacrificial system. I, and I don't. Now, the temple that will be rebuilt, okay, as I understand from my studies, will, will not be sanctioned by God. Okay, so in and of itself, it's a bit of an abomination. All right. Uh, I would assume that your Orthodox Jews are looking to revive the Old Testament system. You know, and so that may be where that's coming from. You already see that anyway. I mean, they're they're trying to do everything they can to re, you know, to revive like the, the priestly garments and all that kind of stuff, that whole system. So it would not shock me to know that when you get out here that Israel has now revived the, the Old Testament system of law. There's some commentaries out there right now, and one that's really interesting about uh, mystery Babylon the Great. Uh, one interesting one I've heard is that that is actually an indication of Israel. And so um, wow. that is what's angering God so much, is that they have so flipped this thing on its head and really angered. <laughs> so anyway... Uh, Revelation chapter 19. So let's look at the second thing. So the first thing happening in this 75-day period of time is that the, uh, the, the desecration of the temple will be allowed for an, an extra 30 days. Y'all got to remember, too, I mean, I know Jesus has come back and he can snap his fingers and everything's done, right? But in reality, things happen over time. Okay, there, there's, it's never like this instant transition, all of a sudden, tribulation ends, kingdom starts. There, things have to set up, and there's also a biblical prophecy that must take place. And what you're reading is some prophetic stuff that must happen in order for the kingdom to be set up and ready. Okay, Not just for Jesus, but for, uh, for the world. Revelation chapter 19, look with me, uh, come on down to verse 20. And the beast was taken, the beast here being the Antichrist. I know that just when you go back and you read the, the symbolism in previous chapters. I'm just cutting to the chase for this study. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet uh, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast, now so, circle this word, alive into a, lot, a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the second thing that's going to happen within this period of time is that the beast or the Antichrist will be cast into the lake of fire, but he will be cast alive into the lake of fire. Now this is where some of our previous studies are going to really come in handy. All right, so read and pay attention. I'm on it. Okay. This is at, at the end of the tribulation during the campaign of Armageddon. Armageddon is a series of battles and it, and it culminates and then eventually Jesus is on his throne. Okay, But the, the, during the tribulation, the campaign of Armageddon, Christ himself is going to kill Antichrist. 
Okay? That's going to be a real collision there. You got the real Messiah and the counterfeit Messiah going head to head. And we know how that turns out, right? But just so you see it, I want you to go with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 real quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, look with me at verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Now we've studied this and remember when he says, and then that wicked shall be revealed after the rapture. Okay, so when the dispensation of, of the grace of God is lifted, when God determines that that is over and the church is removed from the earth, Okay, then the wicked, the Antichrist, he will be revealed. Now watch what happens. And, and we get a description here. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What's going to be interesting is God's going to just show, or Jesus is just going to show up and he's going to go, <laughs> and this big mighty dude is just going to collapse. You know, I mean, it is just going to be really... In some ways, very humorous because he just he's high and mighty. Okay, so we know Jesus is going to he is going to kill off the Antichrist. Go back with me now to Isaiah chapter fourteen. Isaiah chapter fourteen. In your mind, you turn back to Isaiah, you kind of got to go back to the, to the prophetic timeline here. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about Israel there, the central focus of prophet, the prophetic scriptures. Isaiah chapter 14, and begin reading with me in verse 3. This is a description here of, of when we get down to the end of the tribulation period, of this interaction between Messiah, the true Messiah, and Antichrist. Isaiah chapter 14, beginning in verse 3. And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy fear and from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke... He that ruled the nations in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. When is the whole earth going to be at rest? It ain't today, I can tell you that. I don't know if y'all watch any news or read any news lately, but it ain't at rest right now. And it's not going to be until we get out here, okay? And he goes on. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. Verse 8. Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is coming up against us. Verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. He's talking about Sheol. This place of death okay and the prophecy here is concerning the one who is going to go there when the Lord consumes him with the brightness of his coming okay and he's talking about the Antichrist he goes on verse uh, 10 all they shall speak and say unto thee hold on hold on hold on that's what it says right there y'all just don't see it <laughs> hold on Art thou also become weak as we? How did you, what are you doing down here? We're mere mortals. Okay? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. So Jesus is going to kill him off He's going to go to the grave. 
Now go over uh, to verse uh, 16. Same chapter, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 16. They that see thee shall never... So now when we get to verse 16, so that, that little passage we just read there is kind of the vision from down in the grave. Now we're going to pop up on top of the ground and we're going to see the, the view of this dead dude from, you know, on the earth. And that's when we get verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? <laughs> Y'all remember, was it Gaddafi? I think it was when Gaddafi was killed, you know, and they drug him. There was, I remember seeing the news, and they were, they were carrying him and dragging him through the streets. And... and that's the kind of vision that I get in my head about this when you, when you read about this. I mean, this is the man that has so upset the entire world that forced worship of himself. He just was so high and mighty. And there he is, a lump of flesh. And people are going to wonder and go, are you kidding me? I couldn't eat or feed my babies. My mother died because of that man? That wee little man? That's what's going to happen. It goes on, uh, verse 17, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. He goes on, all the kings of the nations, even all of them lie in glory, everyone in his own house, but thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch and as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet, thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and, and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with seeds. One of the things we find out, Jesus is going to kill the Antichrist, He's going to die, but he will not receive a burial. He will be left in the streets to rot. Okay, he will not get the honor. Now, so capture this scene. Christ will kill Antichrist early in the battle of Armageddon. You ready, Rita? I'm ready. This man's soul... <laughs> you like that. This man's soul will go to Sheol. It's going to go down to the pit. Okay? But his body is going to be sitting there on the ground. On the earth. There will be a separation. Okay? Then, during this 75 day period of time, this Antichrist will be resurrected. That means his soul will be reunited with his flesh. Okay? Be resurrected so that, just what we saw there in Revelation, he can be cast, what? Alive into the lake of fire. He once was dead. Now he's dead. <laughs> he's alive dead. Okay? He will be cast alive into the lake of fire. And now this, this is really, this is where we see the genius of God, but we also kind of see some irony here. The, the scriptures speak of the, the first and second resurrections, right? So you, you get the first resurrection of the righteous or the saved, the living, right? And when, when the Scriptures talk about the first and the second res resurrection, it speaks of them in stages. Okay? It doesn't all just happen at one time. So, for example, uh, Jesus, the first fruits, right? Then at the rapture, we also are saved. That's another part of the first resurrection. Then, when we get out here to the end of the tribulation, there's going to be another resurrection of saints going into the kingdom. Okay, so you see all of those stages, but that's considered part of the first resurrection. There's also a second resurrection. What's going to happen way out here after the kingdom? 
A great white throne judgment, and that will be the unjust or the lost. But that second resurrection also has stages to it. And so what happens is Jesus is said to be the first fruits of the first resurrection. The Antichrist, though, remember, he has posed himself as Christ. He has counterfeited the Messiah. And so here's what God says. All right, you want to be like the Messiah? Well, he's the first fruits, and his resurrection will be unto glory. You also get to be resurrected too. Except your eternal home will be the lake of fire. There you go. You wanted it, Antichrist. You got it. Boom! I love that! Y'all better wake up! Man! Thank you, Karen, for laughing, for feeling good today. It's a donut. She's feeling happy. She's got sugar coursing through her veins. It's good. I'm liking it. Man, that, if I was a preacher, that would be a stomping moment right there. Because I'm telling you, that's good. Y'all y'all are dead. Every one of y'all is so dead. Get out of here. Y'all ain't got a spirit bone in your body. What time I got? I got 10 minutes to get this number three. Go back to Revelation chapter 19. And this one will take just a couple seconds. Revelation chapter 19. So the Antichrist, two things. Desolation of the temple is going to be brought to a close. The Antichrist is going to be killed off. Okay, uh, And then he will be resurrected so he can be kicked out. Now, remember, the Antichrist is the first fruit. He will be the first soul to enter the lake of fire. He's going to get there. He's going to go, hello, hello, is anybody there? Not really, because he's going to be in torture. And guess what? The only one there sure is Hillary him. Hillary won't be there waiting on What's that? Hillary will be there waiting on <laughs> No, because... <laughs> I'm not going to bite the bait. <laughs> he is the first fruit. Okay? He's the first fruit. All right, Revelation chapter 19, look at verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. So the third thing that's going to happen in this interval here is the false prophet or the counterfeit Holy Spirit. See, during the tribulation period, you've got this counterfeit deity. You've got the dragon or the devil, which is sort of the counterfeit God the Father. You've got Antichrist or the beast, which is the counterfeit son or the counterfeit Messiah, and then you have the false prophet who is the counterfeit Holy Spirit, okay? And so he also is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And so, um, again, now think of the order here. This is leading into the kingdom. The great white throne judgment has not happened yet. So the, the dead or the lost of all time have not yet been judged to be cast into the lake of fire yet. So at this point, there are only two individuals in that lake of fire. Antichrist and the false prophet. Not even the devil's there yet. So they're in Sheol? They, they are in Sheol when they're first killed, but then when they are resurrected, they are then cast alive into the lake of fire. Now this is another study that has come up when I was, when I was studying for this that we need to do, might do this next week, is understanding all these afterlife places. <laughs> Okay, especially when you start talking about hell or Sheol, the grave, the pit, the abyss, Abaddon. There's all these different terms. There's a bunch of them. Okay, and so we'll, we'll maybe look at that, and it will just mount and it will light your fire. <laughs> all right. So for a thousand years, a thousand years, the Antichrist, the false prophet, will be there by themselves. And they're not going to be playing patty cake. You talk about gruesome. Man, golly, crazy. All right, so here's a lesson. Don't be the Antichrist. Not a good, not a good thing. All right. Now. What's that? If you think it's hot now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, the humidity is going to be terrible. Read it. Do you think there would be any significance where it says these both were cast alive into a lake? Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I did think about that this morning. I thought, hmm, 
when we get into our study of this afterlife kind of stuff, now, one of the things that you've got to remember, I do believe there are going to be, and when I say I believe, you, you, when you study the Scriptures, you can see that there are, for lack of a better term, levels or compartments of the lake of fire. Um, and so, or positions maybe might be another word you could use. But, kind of just hold that. Not there yet. Really need to dig into that more. I don't know, you know, honestly, it's to me it's kind of in a, in a similar sense like heaven. Look, man, if I'm out there digging ditches, or if I'm up in the ivory tower in heaven, I don't care. I'll be in heaven, you know. I'll have a latrine duty in heaven. That's fine by me. I don't care, you know. Uh, I think in the lake of fire, it's not going to matter. Well, I was trying to find it where it says the lake of fire. The lake of fire. Yeah, I, I did pick up on that too, and it's, it's really interesting. I don't know if my margin, marginal note has anything to say about it. My marginal note actually it does have the, so I need to look at that. Uh, I'll, I'll look at the Greek here in just a second and try to come back to it. All right, take a break. Cut.